All right. It's good to see everyone again. I'm glad to be back here. Today we're going to be talking about a topic we normally don't encounter in church, but I think it's worth knowing about. We're going to be talking about radioisotope dating. This is determining the age of something, not going out and trying to find a mate. So, with that being said, uh, we always got to start in prayer because we're talking about, even if we're talking about some scientific things and chemistry things, we're ultimately dealing with God and God's Word and God's world. So if we're going to have a productive time, we better ask God's blessing. What do you all figure? I figure so. So in this church, one thing we always emphasize is confession of sin. As James writes in his short epistle, we do not have because we do not ask, and we ask and we do not receive because we ask with a bad heart or with bad motives. So we're supposed to ask God for things, we're supposed to thank God for things, and we're supposed to tell God when we screw up. Now this confession of sin, we don't have to do it in any particular uh, ritualistic way. We don't have to tell a priest. We don't have to write it down. All we got to do is tell God in heaven that uh, what we've done wrong, how we've violated his commandments and his character, and the Son will intercede for us. So we always give you all a few moments of silent prayer to make sure you're in right relation with God so that he will listen to your prayers. So let's get going. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together as a body of believers to enjoy fellowship one with another and to discuss things related to your word and your world. I've got a few things to ask you for, and a few things to thank you for, and I hope you'll incline your ear to our requests. Pray for all those folks that are having trouble with the hurricanes, the three of them, and the fires, and the earthquake in Mexico. Uh, I ask you to comfort those people. And while you're through the comfort, bring ministers of the gospel so that the words of life will reach people that otherwise wouldn't reach and they will consider the, uh, the eternal life through your son. Pray for our pastor, Robbie Dean. I ask you to help, help him to keep having a good time, not to eat too many Magnum bars, and to bring him home safely to us. Finally, I ask that you're, you'll be here with us today, that you'll help me to speak well and speak truth and help everyone listening in the audience and online to be able to understand that we'll and that we will all have a better appreciation for your glory when we leave than when we, than when we walked in. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, in whom we have life and hope. Amen. All right. So, like I, I, I tend to like to do, uh, have interactive uh, presentations. So, I've planned to actually have you yell things at me, and so I can talk back to you. So, if you've got a question, raise your hand, and I promise I'll get to you. I'll, if you don't ask questions, I'll just keep rambling along with my presentation until we run out of time. But it's more fun for everyone if you interact. Sound good to you? We've got a couple speakers here, uh, or microphones, so that if you talk, talk loudly so that uh, the microphones will pick it up. If you've, anytime I'm getting talking, feel free to raise your hand and I will eventually finish my sentence. Might take a while, but I'll finish my sentence and I'll get to you. Sound good? All right. So that being said, we're going to talk about radioisotope dating. Now, this is primarily going to deal with carbon-14 dating. But at the end, I want to real fast go through long-age radioisotope dating. Now, my guess is most of the folks out there don't know what, what these are and what the differences is, are. But I figure that by the time we're done, you will have, you'll, you'll have an idea. So one of those things, since I'm an engineer by trade, I work in the oil and gas business, this is one of those things that... It, I hear his objections to the Bible frequently. Hasn't carbon dating disproven the Bible? Hasn't the uh, radio, radio isotope dating disproven the Bible? And most people don't have an idea about it. Uh, in fact, my, I was talking to my sister who was talking to someone else and they, they told her that, well, that's just too complicated for anyone to understand. Only the really, really smart scientist people can do that. Well, I don't think that's a good idea. As we talked about last week, the only people who can have knowledge at all are those who follow the Bible. So I figured that uh, you, you guys can understand the basics of carbon dating and long-age radioisotope dating and what that means. So the, my goal for you today is not to make you all experts on these topics, but so that you know the basics of them. And so when you encounter them, when you encounter someone throwing these fiery darts at the Word of God, you know enough that, uh, about how to you know, stiff arm that a little bit. 
or to where to go for answers. And that there are good answers, and you don't have, just have to take it on faith alone that there's an answer, but there really isn't. You, you, make sense to y'all? Okay. So what we're going to do today is we, I've got five points I want to go through. Talk, we're going to talk about the basics of chemistry. Now, this is like real basic sixth grade chemistry stuff, just proton, neutron, electron sort of thing. I'll promise you I'll get to something neat. We're going to talk about afterwards the basics of carbon dating. That's uh, just how it works, what the assumptions go into it, how things are calculated, and how we eventually end up with age estimates. Then we're going to talk about the significance of carbon-14 dating. Why does this matter? Why am I talking about this stuff? And how does this work with God's Word and God's world? After that, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about recalibrating some carbon-14 ages because, so they fit better with the Bible. And uh, stuck on the end, I'm going to talk about long-age radioisotope dating. Now, long-age dating is worthy of a whole presentation in and of itself, but I don't think I'm going to, this congregation will stand for me talking twice about chemistry, so I'll try to smush them together. Sound good? Yeah. Good. So what we're going to do today is, when I was a kid, I, my mom would go and fix me a plate of food, and we'd have, I'd have all kinds of things on there. I'd have some steak, maybe some potatoes. But then I, I always had this gross stuff like Brussels sprouts and broccoli. And I had to eat it. I had to clean my plate because my mom said it was good for me. So what I would do is I would eat those Brussels sprouts and that broccoli first and just get that nasty stuff out of the way so I could actually enjoy the meal, eat the good things. And we're going to do that today. So we're going to get through the Brussels sprouts that are good for us but aren't really that much fun talking about chemistry. And by the time we get to the end, I think it's going to be neat how these, uh, the sci this semi-technical topic uh, can encourage us in, our, in the, our confidence in the Bible. So start here we go. We've got three basic subatomic particles. A subatomic particle is sub means it's below and uh, uh, below the atom. So we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are the first, they come from the Greek word protos, which means first. It was the first particle discovered. It has mass and a positive charge, and it resides in the nucleus of an atom. An atom basically has the, the nucleus, which is the center, and there's electrons that go around it. Neutron has mass but no charge. You can think of a neutron kind of like a proton with an electron stuck on top of it. So it's got mass but it has no charge. And an electron, you see the relative mass is about one two thousandth of the others. It has no, it's a fit, it basically has no mass at all, but it has a negative charge. In a balanced atom, the number of electrons and the number of protons will always equal. Otherwise, it wouldn't be balanced because they have to have a, a zero charge. Okay, so here's a few just technical terms. You have the atomic number. Atomic number is the number of protons in an atom. And this determines their placement on the periodic table of elements and their general properties. For example, hydrogen always has one, new, one proton. Now you can have isotopes of that you get with a no, different numbers of neutrons, but the, but the protons always determine what the element is. Second, we have the atomic mass. This is the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. So you add the numbers of protons, add the number of neutrons, and you figure out how much, how much mass this thing has. All right. And we're gonna be talking about radioactive things, so we're gonna deal with half-lives. A half-life is the time required for a quantity to reduce to half its initial value. So anything that's decaying will normally have a half-life. So radio radioactive elements have, take a certain amount of time to decay or to turn into something else. And for we're going to get to but the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So just to illustrate this, if you had 12 pounds of carbon-14 after one half-life or 5,700 years, you would have, how much would you have left? You start off with 12, one half-life, how much do you have left? Six. Six. Another half-life goes by, how, many, how much do you have? Three. Three. And then you have one and a half, and it just keeps on going down. Make sense? Okay, nothing too complicated yet, right? All right, so here's the periodic table of elements. And uh, you can see that if you uh, look here like on boron, boron here has, a, has five up here. This is the atomic number, that's five. And you see, it might be hard to see, but they've got a, the mass number is about 10, 10.1. So you, you average the various weights of the, 
of the isotopes and you add them together and you get you get the, the weight mass so that's the that's that anyway we're gonna be talking about carbon 14 carbon has three regular isotopes the, the, the most common isotope of carbon is uh, carbon 12 that means it has six protons and six neutrons oh let me define an isotope first an isotope is any of two or more forms of a chemical element having the same number of protons in the nucleus or the same atomic number but having different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus or different atomic weights. So you can have the, a, a, an element have different uh, weights because of the different number of neutrons. And you can just keep stacking neutrons on there until the nucleus becomes unstable. So the most common isotope of carbon is carbon-12 that has six protons, six neutrons. There's also a carbon-13, which has six protons and seven neutrons. That's stable. These are, these are going to stick around. They're not going to decay. However, we're talking about carbon-14, which has how many protons? Six, and it has eight neutrons. The, the, the nucleus has gotten too big for the number of protons in it, and what this does is it makes it unstable and it starts to decay. It decays by what we call beta decay, which means it shoots out a, uh, an electron and a, a proton flips to an, or a neutron flips to a proton, turns it turns to nitrogen. So. We, 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 everyone tracking with me so far? Have I lost anybody yet? Basically understanding what's going on? Okay, so here's a diagram. I'll just talk you through this. This is how carbon-14 enters our world. The idea of carbon-14, we, we have, uh, does anyone know what the most abundant element in the atmosphere is? It's nitrogen, nitrogen-14, by the chemical formula N2. There's about 70% of, uh, of what we have in the atmosphere is nitrogen. So what happens is we have solar cosmic rays or from the sun go and hit, hit the nitrogen in the atmosphere, or neutrons come out, and, the and they hit the nitrogen atoms, and they displace a proton, and a neutron takes its place. So it, so it flips a nitrogen into nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. Now carbon-14, it doesn't just stay up there by itself. It goes and, uh, goes and finds oxygen and makes carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide then is taken in by plants, and the, and the plants use that to make food, and then animals eat the plants. And eventually, everything that's alive reaches equilibrium with carbon-14 in the, in the uh, biosphere. That means that it uh, reaches the same level. And as long as you're alive, you are exchanging carbon with your environment. And so as carbon decays in your body, you take, take carbon-14 back in. Understand? So when, when we do, uh, now when things die, are they exchanging carbon with their environment anymore? No, they are not. So this is where carbon-14 start, uh, dating starts. It, do, it does not determine when something was born or when something was made, if it was man-made. It, it's when something started, when something died or stopped exchanging carbon with the environment. So. You can't, so you can only date, so the car, half life of carbon is 5,730 years. Only substances which were once alive may be carbon dated. So you can't date a rock unless it was one, once alive. You can, you can carbon date limestone because limestone comes from sea creatures. You can, so, theoretically, you could carbon date a fossil if it still has organic material. You can carbon date wood. You can carbon date clothing if it's not synthetic, if it's made out of wool or something. So you can only carbon date things that were once alive. And uh, interesting, any sample that's over 100,000 years old should be radiocarbon dead. That means it contains, oh, I need to fix that. But it means it contains no uh, carbon-14. Hmm, oh, I plugged in. Oh, there we go. So. The reason for this being that, once again, what's the half-life of carbon-14? 5730 years. So if you've gone 100,000 years, you've got a bunch of half-lives, right? At that point, all the carbon in the, in the sample should have decayed. All the carbon-14 in the sample should have decayed. In fact, if the entire mass of the Earth was made out of carbon-14 only, in only one million years, not a single atom of carbon-14 would be around because the half-life of carbon-14 is so relatively short. Now, I've got a question for you. Are there any objects whose supposed evolutionary age is over 100,000 years that contain measurable radiocarbon? Hmm? Anyone have an idea? 
Answer, yes. All tested coal, limestone, wood, and even diamond samples contain carbon-14, even they are, though they are supposedly tens to hundreds of millions years old. And in diamonds, sometimes they're thought to be more than a billion years old. Now, is this a problem for the evolutionary worldview? Yes. See, I, I love it when, I, when people come up and tell me that they can't believe the Bible because carbon-14 has proven it's wrong. So, i got some examples here. Now, you, you, are you, do you understand with me why a sample that's 100,000 years old would have no carbon-14 in it? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, if you get something that's allegedly 300 million years old and it contains active radiocarbon, what deduction can you make? It's been less than, it's been less than 100,000 years since it stopped exchanging carbon with its environment, right? So, I've got some examples here. From, these come from Andrew Snelling. He's a geologist with Answers in Genesis. So there's a sample of a, uh, of a limestone in one, of, in one of the quarries from Edge Hill in England. And there's uh, pieces of fossilized wood in that quarry that supposedly date to 150 to 200 million years old. Yet they re yielded radiocarbon ages of only 200,000 to 28,000 years. Now, oh yeah, now the way the way we uh, I need to talk the way we calibrate this is we can we, all of you are radioactive. Did you know that? Because all of you have carbon-14 in you, and the carbon-14 is constantly decaying at a half-life of 5,730 years. Now we can go take a sample of your tissue, or take a sample of a tree, or anything. And we can check the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, regular carbon to radioactive carbon. And, that, and it will be about the same in every single thing that's alive today. So that's our, that's our baseline, right? That's our initial conditions. So then later on, if we find something that's been dead for a while, whatever it is, you can measure, you can find the ratio. And, if you, and th since we know the rate, it's kind of like, a, it's kinda like a, an hourglass. We know the we know the rate that it's uh, that the, that the one is turning to the other. That's the uh, how fast the sand is going through the hourglass, right? We got the parent ele element at the top. That's uh, that's carbon 14, and we, uh, on the bottom is carbon 12. So we can see this ratio. And if we have a lot, if we have very little carbon 14 in, in comparison to carbon 12, then we can figure that the thing has been dead for a, quite a while. Yeah. Tracking with me, get to understand the basics. It's not that complicated. Just, just so we got other examples. We got a sample of mudstone from uh, the Great Northern Seam and the Upper Permian Newcastle coal measures of the of a coal mine in Australia, and it's supposedly hundreds of millions of years old. And this this coal pictured here has an age of thirty three thousand years. And we got a sea creature called an ammonite. This is a, an ammonite, basically is like a squid with a shell. And it's been, it was found with some fossilized wood near, near it. And the fossil, both the wood and the ammonite were supposed to be about 120 million years old or so. And they both yielded radiocarbon ages of only thousands of years. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. What do you think? Now, I could literally show thousands of examples. I'm not going to because that would be boring. But every, we have never tested a sample that is radiocarbon dead. If evolution were true and life and things have been alive for hundreds of thousands or millions of years, do you think there should be samples of organic material that don't have any radiocarbon in them? We've even encountered radiocarbon in diamonds. In fact, every coal seam that around the world averages it has an average age of about 40,000 years. Now they sometimes are a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower, but every coal seam has about the same age. That's kind of interesting. And the evolutionary uh, idea for the age of these coals is anywhere from 30 million years old to 300 million years old, but they all have the same radiocarbon age. Why do you think that might be? If, what, what was that? Say that loud so they can, people can pick it, pick it up. They're not that old. And in fact, how old? Do you, what is the age difference of the? Uh, of the, the supposedly 50 million year old coal and the supposedly 300 million year old coal. They're the same age. They're, They're the same, same age. age. At least they stopped exchanging carbon with their environment at the same time. Now, I want to give you all, I want you all to give me an educated guess. When, if all, let, I'm going to have a postulate, have a hypothesis, that all coal 
came about at roughly the same time. What event do you think caused all the world's coal beds? The flood. The flood. <laughs> yes. Because uh, the flood, I talked about the flood a while back, but the flood basically destroyed the world as we knew it. The earth that then was being flooded with water perished, and everything that was alive on it died. So everything that was there got buried, and you had massive coal beds. So I think this is a great confirmation of the biblical worldview. What do you think? Yeah, carbon-14 is our friend, not our enemy. So I got some questions. So let's talk about the accuracy of this. I was, I've got a friend in seminary who was asking me if carbon-14 was good for anything. And I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> so a question, are carbon-14 ages accurate? Does anyone have an answer? <laughs> well, okay. All right, I like that answer, Natasha. Up to 100,000 years. Now, how old do we think the Earth is 100,000 years old? or le Greater or lesser than 100,000? Less. 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 So there are things we have, uh, there are diamonds that have been radiocarbon tested to be 80,000 years old. Is that diamond 80,000 years old, do we think? No. No, we believe in thousands of years, you know, a shorter number of thousands. So, we, so they are not accurate to a certain extent, but they are accurate in some measures. Here's the answer. Yes, carbon-14 ages are accurate about, to the, about back to 400 B.C. That's about 2,400 years ago. So if you're a history guy, that's about the time of Alexander the Great, ballpark. So, and we know this based on dating samples of known ages. So if we got so something from history that we have historical you know, history books about and we know where it comes from because... We have written records about it, and we, t t t we test it. We get, we're really close to, to accurate back to about uh, 2,400 years ago. We get beyond that, and the ages start to be inflated beyond what the, what the known ages are. So does anyone know why that might be? So I got a question then. Why are carbon-14 dates for older samples inaccurate, but the recent samples are accurate? It's kind of an odd situation, isn't it? You normally would expect it either to be all good or all bad, right? Here's the answer. There's people have incorrect assumptions. Now, what I was talking about last, last time was that if you reject the Bible, you reject the God of the Bible, the, the history of the Bible, then you're, you're left in the unenviable uh, situation that you can't know anything. And all of your ideas of the world are based upon lies. So you end up with wrong conclusions. And that's what happens here. The reason why things are accurate more recently, is because carbon-14 is cal calibrated for today. See, these uh, scientists have made the assumption that you go measure the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 in a sample today, that that ratio is the same as it was forever. But if things were different back in the past, if there were different ratios of carbon, would that, m would that maybe skew the results? Yes. It would. So... Here's, here's a, uh, two factors that will in, impact that. One is the Earth's magnetic field. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but the Earth's magnetic field is constantly getting weaker. It has a half-life of about 1,500 years. So we live in about 2000 AD. Uh, so how much stronger would the Earth's magnetic field have been f at 500 AD, 1,500 years ago? It'd be twice as strong. Now, that, now, and then how, old, how strong would it have been about the time of David, you know, 1000 B.C.? Four times as strong. So the Earth's magnetic field is constantly getting weaker, and it would have been significantly stronger at the time of creation and the time of the flood. Now, the Earth's magnetic field has a, interacts with cosmic rays. These, remember, the, is the sun sends neutrons or rays to interact, hit the, the, the nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it causes the nitrogen to flip into carbon, right? So if, if you, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from that, and it, and it, keeps, few, uh, it keeps the sun's radiation from hitting the atmosphere. So if there's less radiation hitting the atmosphere, what does that do to generation of carbon-14? It lessens it. You'd have less carbon-14 in the atmosphere. If you have less car carbon-14 being generated, what would that do to the, your uh, assumption of initial conditions? Your assumption of how much carbon-14 is, is in a sample to start with before it dies. 
it would skew it. You look at a sample that might have just died, but you think it was much older because it didn't have as much carbon-14 in it. Make sense? All right. The second one, the second is the idea is the greater biomass on Earth prior to Noah's flood. Now, I just want to reason this through with you. So God created the world. He created it good. And we know from Isaiah that God formed the Earth to be inhabited. The other planets were not formed to be inhabited, but the Earth was. And the Earth was teemed with life, both in the sea, on the air, on the land. So when God created the earth, what would you, what was a word you'd use to describe it, given how it interacted with life? What do you think? Was it good for life or bad for life? Good. It's good for life. I might think of, you might call it a paradise. Absolutely perfect for life. And you could have, what do you think you had a lot of life or a little bit of life on the earth? A lot. So now after the earth was destroyed by the flood, do you think, we, do you think the earth was better for life or worse for life? after the flood than before the flood. It was worse. We have less life on this uh, biomass. Biomass is just the mass, the weight of all things alive. That's plants, animals, everything else that's alive, insects, everything that's alive. We have less biomass on the earth now than we did before the flood. And we have good reason to believe this scientifically because all those coal beds, they were once alive. There's an enormous amount of coal. All the limestones, limestones come from uh, things that have died and have been uh, calcified. All the limestones you see were, were once alive. So there were used to be far more life on the earth than there was today. So if everything is... Uh, if, any of you ever... I know, we're not Baptists here, right? <laughs> Anyone ever had a drink? I have. Now, if you're, if you're mixing drinks and you have, uh, and, and you have alcohol... You have the same amount of alcohol, but you, but you uh, put it, if you've got two different drinks, one with a little bit of water or you're, you're cutting with, or you, one with a lot of water, what's that going to do for the concentration? If you have, if you have more, more water you're, you're mixing the alcohol in, how is the alcohol going to be? Is it going to be dilute or concentrated? Dilute. It, this, is, this is similar to the, uh, having more biomass, because you have the same amount of carbon-14 to go around, and it's equally distributed among all life. So before the flood, would you have more carbon-14 in creatures or less? Less. Because you have this, you have this, uh, even if you have the same amount of carbon-14, you'd have to spread it out over more biomass, so it would be less concentrated. Understand? So, and if you combine that with the idea of the Earth's magnetic field having less carbon-14 to start with, when you have less carbon-14 to start with and you have more biomass, Combined, that would make a drastic reduction in the amount of carbon-14 in samples before the flood. So that's why we end up with coal seams that date to 30,000 or 40,000 years. If you take into account these differences, these, these dates can be brought into line with the biblical ages. So because of the, uh, the Earth's magnetic field, we have a lower rate of carbon-14 production because we're blocking cosmic rays from hitting the Earth and and uh, creating carbon-14. We have a greater volume of regular carbon because we have more biomass. All that coal stuff was alive at the time. And because of that, we have a lower ratio of radiocarbon, that's carbon-14, to regular carbon, that's carbon-12. So if you, if you assume that today is normative and then you try to date a pre-flood sample by those, uh, by those dates, by those assumptions, will you get a lower age or a, an older age or a younger age for the sample? older because of what you have assumed you will get an older age and, and the reason why your assumptions are incorrect is because you have assumed that the Bible and its history are incorrect if you'd taken into account the Bible and its history you wouldn't make this sort of mistake but carbon-14 is actually useful to us it, help, it shows us that, uh, that God's world uh, follows with God's word and that, the, and that the, the evolutionists can't even make sense of their own device with their own assumptions understand? sound good? Do we have any questions? No? All right, here's a... I couldn't get this bigger without you know, distorting it. This is just a graphic form of what I was showing you. So we have, uh, if you have a stronger magnetic field, then it, it reduces the amount of neutrons that hit the atmosphere. You can see if they're, they're, kind of, they're bouncing off the, uh, the magnetic field here. So there's fewer of them getting through, so we have fewer carbon-14 atoms are formed. And then because we have more biomass, 
there's greater volume of regular carbon, you know, all the, all the dinosaurs and the plants and such, because in more biomass, it's more dilute, and the, thus, thus the ratio of regular radiocarbon to, to uh, radio, radiocarbon to regular carbon is lower. So that, that skews the results. Okay, well, hmm, we're moving pretty fast. Y'all have been pretty quiet. Are you, are you understand? Understand? Do you have any questions? I'm about to dive into long age radioisotope dating. So, if you've got questions for carbon dating, let's talk. Anybody got anything? I don't know which dating it is, but I would like at some point you address the finding from Mount St. Helens and how. We're going to talk about that in the next section. <laughs> Okay. I'm actually, uh, uh, Mount St. Helens is de deals with long age radioisotope dating, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm going to go in less detail with the long age stuff that I want with the carbon dating, but we can get there. We can get through that, and I'll, I'll talk about that. It's a good question, Billy. That was about uh, the question was about uh, about car about Mount St. Helens dating. If you couldn't pick it up on the mic, do we have any other questions? No. Either I'm completely mystifying them, or they completely understand. Okay, so let's talk about long-age radioisotope dating. This is separate from carbon dating. So here's some, uh, it's used to date igneous and metamorphic rocks, and it starts from the time they solidified. So what time, so what starts the clock on carbon dating? Who remembers? If it dies. If it dies, when it stops exchanging carbon with its environment. For long-age radioisotope dating, the assumption is when the rock solidifies. It was once liquid, like if, if an igneous rock, what kind of rock is igneous? Volcanic means it was once was magma, came out of volcano or something, and and you date that it's from the time it became solid, it became a rock, and, and metamorphic rock was once often was once from igneous that was you know shifted, so that's when it starts. And it, you do not date organic materials with this, you date rocks. Now here's some interesting things: all samples of known historical ages tested by long age radioisotope dating have yielded vastly inflated age estimates. I think that I find that really remarkable. Now what that means is if you go and take a rock of known age and you test it, the, the long age method will give you a much, much older age. For example, Billy, <laughs> rocks taken, uh, Steve Austin did this if you know him, Dr. Steve Austin. He took rocks from the lava dome of the, that came from the 1986 eruption of Mount St. Helens. The, the big one was 1980 and erupted in 1982 and small eruptions in 86 and other times. But he took a rock from the 1986 eruption of Mount St. Helens, of which we have video. You have historical witness. We know exactly how old it is and he tested it by potassium argon dating and they found it was 380,000 years old. Does that, does that sound right? No. 1986 was what, about 30 years ago or so, right? Is it, what's the difference? 30, 30 years, 30, 380,000? Now, it gets wor it's worse than this. I mean, we, every single rock we've ever tested of known age, like Mount Etna in Sicily, there's uh, several times that Mount Etna erupted, and we know that from Roman history, from Carthaginian history. We, te we test those. They should be about, uh, you know, about 30 B.C. or so, 4, 4 A.D., and they, and they come up of hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. So we've got a question. Is long age radioisotope dating accurate? No. no, it's not. In fact, that's actually the wrong question to ask because we know it's not accurate. If we can't trust it on things that we can't calibrate on things that we know the age of, then how can we use it at all? How can we trust it at all? So the answer is no, it is not accurate. And that's, that's emphatic. No with an exclamation mark. No, we can't verify it. So if you're trusting on long age radioisotope dating, then you're just ha taking a blind faith position. And I love this because I, I'm constantly accused by these atheists or supposedly scientifically literate people that I'm just a dumb Christian that takes everything on blind faith and can't think for myself. And I'm wondering, how are you trusting this? I mean, you don't have any evidence that this works, that this gives no uh, correct ages, and yet you believe it all the same. That, that's a kind of faith. Is that faith with, uh, for, is, is, do you have a good reason for that faith or is that just an assumption? It's blind faith. It's just blind faith. Bible calls us to have faith in God, but we're not supposed to have blind faith. Like in the Gospel of John, 
John gave us those seven great signs so that we will believe. He gave us a reason to believe. If Jesus really did all those things, then he is the Son of God and he is the life from the dead. But So the, here's the real question. Why is long-age radioisotope dating not accurate? We know it's not accurate. Everyone who knows about, about this should know that it's not accurate. Why is it not accurate? Does anyone have an idea? What you said earlier, things are different in the past. Right? Yes, uh, things are different in the past. That's a good answer. Uh, which, the way I put it is incorrect <laughs> assumptions, bad assumptions. The reason why we had, uh, we had problems with, with carbon-14 in older samples that's because they had different, wrong assumptions about the past because they ignored the Bible's history, right? So, what, the way this works. Now, uh, we've, got the, we've got the hourglass here. So, there's several different elements you can look at for long-age radioisotope dating. Uh, potassium to argon, or, or rubidium that decays to strontium, or neodymium that the decays of samarium. I mean, there are all these, and then uranium eventually will decay to lead. There's a whole bunch of different processes. I don't think it's important to go through all of them. I can point them out on the periodic table for you if you want. But basically what you do is you pick one element. Let's just call it uranium. See, so you got the U's up here for uranium. And so that's the, that's the, the uranium we call the parent element. And over a certain amount of time, called, uh, over their half-life, uranium would decay into lead. So if you look at the, uh, the hourglass, you'll see, you say at the top you got uranium, bottom you got lead. And we know the decay rate, that's the, uh, that's the half-life. So if you come in and you see this, you, could, uh, you can figure out maybe how long ago I flipped over this hourglass, right? If, you, if we know how much is on the top, how much is on the bottom to start with, and the, decay, and, and the rate that it that changes. That's similar to how this radioisotope dating works. So, the, but there's a number of assumptions that we've got to, we have, we have to make to make sense of this. The first one being that, the, that we know initial conditions. Now, question, did any of you see me flip this over? No. Some of you did, but other ones didn't. If you didn't see me actually flip it over, then maybe this thing was sitting on its side for a while, and then I flipped it over. If it was sitting on its side for 12 hours, and then I flipped it over, and you came in and assumed that it had nothing in the top when it was flipped over, how would your estimate go about the age of at the time? You'd have an incorrect uh, estimate. So we've got to know what initially was in there. Also, you've got to know that the rate is the same. Now, in an hourglass, it'd be kind of hard to change that, but I've got this cheap hourglass back home that's got uh, kind of thick granules, and occasionally they clog the, the, the hole here. So I'll look in there, and there's nothing going through. So if, you, if that happens, what, what go, happens to the age estimate if you assume that it was always flowing to the right rate? Yeah. And then one, one, one other assumption that's real hard to, that doesn't work well with this analogy, is that nothing's been added into it or taken away from it. Now, this is sealed, so I can't get in there without breaking the glass. But in, in a rock, there's no sealed container. There's water can wash over and maybe take some, take some of the daughter element away or add some of the parent element in. And if any of those things happen... Then you have, uh, then you have, skewed your results. So what the what, now? I'm gonna let's talk about uh, potassium and argon. Potassium is, uh, is potassium is a metal. It's a regular element, and argon is a noble gas. That means it's doesn't it doesn't bond with anybody. It's not fun at parties. It just hangs out by itself. Right? And noble gases are fairly slippery because they don't make bonds. So the, evolu so the evolutionists will assume that when a rock solidifies, there is no argon in it. Because if, the, if they figure if there's a rock was liquid, the argon would bubble out. So they assume, make it, now that might be a good, good assumption, might not be, but they make the assumption that there is no argon in the rock initially, no primordial argon. Understand? So uh, therefore, when they go and test this rock, any argon they find in the rock, they assume to be the product of radioactive decay, or the decay of potassium into argon. So then they, they see that ratio, and they try to f see how much argon is in the rock, and they, try to, and they figure out how much decay, radioactive decay would have to occur to get that argon in the rock, and they figure out the age. Now remember, I talked about Mount St. Helens had a potassium argon age of 380,000 years. Do you th any idea why it might have come up so big? Because scientists are stupid and can't measure things? Is that the answer? 
No, they're actually very meticulous. They measure things very well. There's nothing wrong with the measurements in, in either radioisotope, radiocarbon dating or the long-age radioisotope dating. The scientists are very good at measuring substances. The problem here is the interpretation. Now, with, with the Mount St. Helens, how much argon do you think was in that rock? A bunch. There was a bunch of argon in that rock because evidently when that rock was formed, there was a bunch of argon in it. It wasn't all from radioactive decay. So when you go in, when they, when they use potassium argon dating on other rocks, uh, and they assume that there was no initial argon in the rock, how, how valid do you think that assumption is? Not very good. There, we have very good reason to believe that there, that there often is abundant argon in rocks. So it screw, skews that dating method. Tracking with me? Make, it make sense? Good. I like seeing that. I see the heads nodding. Similarly, we, uh, if you've ever, this is a little bit more complicated, I'm not going to, but if you've ever heard of the RATE team, that's radioisotopes and the age of the earth, there was a joint project done by the Institute for Creation Research and some, and some anthropogenesis scientists. They have a number of evidences that show that there's a lot, that the radioactive decay rate probably was greatly accelerated during the flood year. There's, I don't want to go into the details, we don't, it's, it, it gets technical, but if you're interested in it, look it up. There's a couple of books on it, they've got, they've got a couple of videos, thousands, not billions, and I know Andrew Snelling has some DVDs of, uh, that show that, there's uh, his creation series. So if you're in the congregation you're interested, I'll, I'll loan you my copies. But there, so we've got good reason to believe, just, just for the moment, trust me, I'm not, that there's good reason to believe that the, that the decay rate has changed. So. If these things, uh, we, we have good reason that the decay rate has changed with time and that the initial conditions are unknown or different than what is assumed, how likely are the, uh, how accurate are going to be the interpretations of the measurements of these atoms? If they're going to be skewed off. Now, why is this important? What, what, is, uh, what, are the, what is the evolutionist, what is the secularist, use, how, how do they use this against the Bible? Last week I, I made the statement that the evolutionary worldview claims that the Earth is four and a half billion years old, right? So, wh how do they get that number? Does anyone know? The, they're, uh, according to the Big Bang model and their idea of how the solar system came to be, there, when they, uh, the sun was there and there was a bunch of things what they call planet, planet, planetesimals were floating around. Eventually they, they grouped up and formed the planets, but not all of them joined into the planets. And you had some that were wandering, they were still just kind of floating around called asteroids. And eventually one of these things would, it would crash into the earth and become, become a meteor, a meteorite. And we see them. So the, the evolutionists make this assumption that these, me, that these rocks are, are primordial to the solar system, meaning that they were, they first solidified when the solar system formed, when the sun formed. Okay, you understand that? So therefore, when they go there, they can, take, they can test them by these long age methods. There's different ones, but they test them and they get a date of four and a half billion years old. And they say, this rock solidified four and a half billion years ago, and we know that the, this thing is primordial to the solar system, or it was formed when the solar system formed. Therefore, the solar system is four and a half billion years old. Now. There are some problems with that, but that, that's, where the, that's how they get that number. Let's see. We'll talk about that a little bit. But in fact, even within their own methods, there's different, you know, I saw, there's potassium argon you see down here. It's, I try to make this as big as I can, but I'm not sure I can blow it up any better. We have potassium argon dating, we have rubidium strontium, uranium to lead, and samarium to neodymium. Okay? There are different elements that decay into different elements. So that's, a, that's different methods of you, pick, you, of you pick one parent element and one daughter element and you count them. Okay, it's just counting. And if you see that they, they often have discordant dates. What that means is every time you get a date, you have a range of error, right? That's what that, when you see the, uh, like here, the Cardanus basalt, potassium argon age is 516 million years, plus or minus 30 million. Now, whenever you go plus or minus 30 million, that seems like a pretty big error to me. <laughs> like, you know, but that's what they're doing. Now, but look at the, look at the, the see now the, the Cardanus basalt is in the Grand Canyon. I talked about that a little bit the last time about my, you know, when I gave my flood presentation. I saw that with Dr. Austin when I went down the river. But you can see that's in the, in the Grand Canyon. And the potassium argon age is 516 million years. What's the rubidium strontium age of that? 
Is that 516 million? It, 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 for using the Rubinian astronomy method, it dates to 1,100, 1,111 1, million or 1.1 billion, plus or minus 81. Do, do those, those numbers overlap? Not at all. Not at all. They're, they're pretty different. And then if you get the Sumerian Neodymium age, what, what is that? 1,588 million or 1.6 billion? Do any of those numbers overlap? No. So, and then if you look, they, the, these, uh, these other samples, I get, there's several different places where you, you get these samples and they have bad ages. They, I mean, the, at least the, uh, the, the ages they get don't, don't fit. If, if they were all, if their methodology was true, if their assumptions were right, all these ages by these different methods should be about the same. But they give vastly disparate ages. Tracking with me? Make sense? In fact, it's kind of interesting because you see the, uh, the ba Bass Rapids Diabase Sill here. That's look, you see that's the orange line. And you see the Cardanius Basalt. Now, the, now, which one's on top of the other one? Which one's above the higher? Cardanius Basalt or Bass Rapids? The Cardanius Basalt. But look at the Potassium Argon Age. The, uh, or, well, the, uh, the ages are like uh, the Rubidium Strontium here. It shows the Cardanus basalt is older than the Bass Rapids diabase sill. Now, when you have a rock that's on top of another rock, what do you figure? Is the rock on top older or younger? It's, it's younger. So even with just order of events layers of rocks, you've got problems with this. So let's see. There's my. So we here. Here's uh, some. I'm not sure if y'all can read this or not, but these are some pictures of problems with assumptions. Bad dates, bad assumptions come from, or bad dates come from bad assumptions. So we see that, like Mount St. Helens, this is what I was talking about earlier, uh, rock formed at Mount St. Helens in 1986 and yielded a radiometric date age of 350,000 years. We got, there's Mount Naraho is in New Zealand, and we know that there was an eruption in 1954, and it yielded a radiometric age of three and a half million years. So, Anyway, so three, 1954, that's what, seven, 60 years, 70 years, something like that? Is that, is that uh, similar to or dissimilar to three and a half million years? Dissimilar. So we, 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 we trust in this, and this sounds good. And then we got you know, all these different uh, things. So another interesting, uh, so let's see, we got, we got 10 minutes left. I can ramble on for another 10 minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Barb. I've got a question from a live streamer. That's great. Oh, it says how this is from Chuck Hagemeyer. How do scientists explain the difference in ages that carbon fourteen gives us? They nor what they normally do is they claim that there's it's a background radiation that there's a, that there's a, uh, this miscalibration of instruments, or that the sample has been contaminated, or they just ignore it. One of those three things. Uh, that every, every time you use an instrument, you've got to calibrate it. So what they do is they try to put, they put a null sample or something that they say has no carbon in it. But all organic samples have carbon in it. So they, they, they will calibrate it uh, away from that. What they normally do is they, is they make an assumption that we, that we know this, that this coal is 40,000, I mean, 50 million years old, and therefore is your carbon dead. So we're not going to test it. That's what normally is done. Most of these thing, these dates, were found by creationists who said, "What is this? who decided gathered the samples and sent them sent the samples into these uh, dating labs and didn't tell them where they gathered it." So they give they do a blind test and they get these results back. Does that does that answer the question? You think or I don't know. I hope I answered it. Hope. Well, I like that. Does anyone, we have any other questions? Any other live streamers out there that are, that are alive? <laughs> or are live streamers dead? Okay. You got something, David? Yeah. What is it? You said something about calibrating the carbon-14 dating to using our our creationist assumptions. How would how would you go about doing that? Slash, has it been done? There is ongoing work uh, on that right now. It's it's difficult because we've got to figure out how much we got to figure out what the biomass was before the flood. Today, the biomass, the biomass has been re relatively constant in, in, on the wor world in the last several thousand years, I mean, ballpark. We've got to figure that out. We've also got to figure out what the 
rate of the uh, of the generation of carbon-14 was before the flood. So it's it's difficult work, but we, there is ongoing research into that, and it gets technical to get to get the I mean to get the details about how we actually figure that out. But it, it's it's being done, and I think that uh, I know that answers in Genesis. Andrew Snelling and some others are working on it. I think it's some neat work. Um, occasionally I check up on it and see what, what progress has been made. But the, even the old dates are useful to us, and we can try and we can try to figure out a way to to uh, bring them into the biblical time scale. Sound good? Good. We've got seven minutes. We have any more questions? No questions. Oh, we got in the back. No, let, let Barb. Okay, Barb, you got to. Just, just a comment for, for your stuff that's difficult for people to see. We will have the slides up on the website so they can. Yeah, the slides will be on the website so they can be seen. All right. 14 day, you say will only last 100,000. The carbon would only last. We'll say a hundred thousand years mm -hmm. at, at the very maximum. At the maximum, but they show using carbon fourteen that some things are millions of years old. Did you say or hundred? So, in a popular opinion, popular belief, I'd call it an urban legend, that carbon fourteen has proven that the Earth is billions of years old. If they, if someone says that, one thing you can know for certain is they don't know anything about carbon dating. Anyone who knows anything about carbon dating will tell you that it can't be millions of years old. It would only, it's only thousands. So I, I spent more, I talked with carbon 14 first because it is so common that people bring it up and it's so poorly understood. People think it's this arcane mystical thing that, that they have to be genius to understand and that it proves the scientists are right and the Bible's wrong. But no, it's all only thousands. Any, any number you see that's greater than 100,000 is a misunderstanding of what carbon 14 is doing. Make sense? Good. I got a lot live ones in the audience today. Any other questions? Okay. No questions. Any other live streamers got a question, Barb? No. Oh wait, wait, wait. Just two came in. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, which dating method do the majority of scientists like? <laughs> well, that depends. If you're if you're dating things that were once alive. You want to do? You use carbon dating. It's actually it's fairly accurate. But the, now the most common of the uh, see I've got I've got four listed here. The most common of those four is the potassium argon because it's cheapest to, to do. But you know, well, when you, when you, well, when you're a, a scientist, you get get your money based on government grants or something. So you want to make that dollar stretch farther. So you if all if you assume that all the dating methods are equally valid, you go for the one that's most economical, right? So they, t they tend to use potassium argon, but it depends on the sample, you, if uh, the, what, what the rock has. How many more are they than those four? I've, I've read the, about the, the various costs. I don't remember. I've never actually paid for it. If I paid for it, I'd remember. How many more methods? Oh, methods. Oh, there's a, uh, it's about those four. The main ones, there's like four or five, uh, but the main one, yeah, the main ones are here: potassium argon, potassium decays to argon. Let's see, potassium here. That's the that's K. See, the potassium is a potassium forty will decay to argon forty. See, it's, it's you know nineteen to eighteen. Or you'll have uh, samarium will will decay to neodymium. There's samarium and neodymium. Samarium is sixty two here. Neodymium, and then you get uh, what? Uh, there's strontium to um, rub rubidium to strontium. And uh, uranium to lead. So uranium is here 92, lead is 82. So lead goes through like tw 10 or 12. I forget exactly how many decay steps. Well, how, how many elements decay into other elements? Uh, There's a lot. Every single radioactive element will decay. In fact, it, a lot of uh, a lot of the periodic table I have up here does not show it, but a lot of periodic tables will show elements that are just that are radioactive or inherently unstable. And that's basically everything. This uh, everything that's that's heavier than uranium. Neptunium on, that's all radioactive. That will decay. And uh, there's various, even though carbon is normally stable, there's various isotopes of carbon, like carbon-14, that will decay. So there are uh, many radioactive elements in the world. And... Like lead won't decay. I mean, won't it's decay. not radioactive. No, well, there are isotopes of lead that are radioactive, but normal lead is not. Now, remember what an isotope is? Same number of neutrons, I mean, same number of protons, different number of neutrons, right? 
right. So did it, you're answering your questions and making sense? Barb, you said you got you had some questions? Yes. How can you address in easy words that the C-14 dating is not helpful to explain millions of years? Easy words. Easy words. <laughs> Carbon-14 cannot last millions of years. If The longest it can last is 100,000. So if you're talking about millions of years, there's going to be no carbon-14. <laughs> is that easy? It, it, it can only give dates that are less than 100,000 years. Okay, you have another question? Uh -huh. Does the Earth's changing magnetic field influence carbon dating? Yes, it does. Because the Earth's magnetic field protects us from harmful radiation from the sun. And when, you, when it shields us from that radiation from the sun, it makes it mean there's less solar radiation hitting the nitrogen in our atmosphere. The way we have carbon uh, start out, carbon-14 is generated, is nitrogen-14. See, nitrogen is here, it's a, you got a mass of 14, atomic number seven. Nitrogen gets hit by the solar radiation and flips into carbon-14. So if you have a hot, stronger magnetic field in the past, you'll have less carbon-14 generated. So therefore, we'll have a lower concentration of carbon-14 and if you make the assumption that we don't have a lower concentration, then it will have an inflated age. Make sense? All right. Do we have any other questions? We've got about another two minutes. No? All right. Well, I'll give you about 20 seconds. Anything else come in, Barb? No. No. Okay. Well, in that case, I suppose there's no harm in get, um, praying and getting out of here a bit early. What do you think? Let's, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity we've had to come together and talk about your word and talk about your world. I ask that you strengthen our faith and help us to always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within us. I pray for Robbie out in Italy, be with him. I pray for everyone who's having difficulty with, uh, with natural disasters or with sickness in their life or with, with problems with government or with other people. I ask you to be with them. And we all know that Ultimately, the only hope and the only way that we can solve these problems is the return of your Son. So all of us who have this hope fixed on you, say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and save us. So in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, and we have hope and life. Amen.